Thanks, Andrea. Oh, and this meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy to have you all. This is um, a, a topic and presentation that's close to my heart. And so I just wanted to welcome, I'm not sure how many of you have been to a Masterpieces at Midday and how many of you are newbies, but welcome to all of uh, all of you and I'm going to get started by sharing my screen so I'm going to say goodbye for a second and you'll see uh, a bunch of images that I've got lined up for you and then at the end um, I'll pop back in so bear with me for just one second I'm going to go to share screen I'm going to go to my screen and then you all can see that yeah and then I'm going into presenter mode you can see that as well great so uh, today we are doing Masterpieces at Midday and we're going to be talking about Orozco, Rivera, and Siqueiros. And I have to say, well, I'll just go back. This is a, um, as the director of an art museum, I don't often get the opportunity to talk about art and artists and the works in our collection only because we have excellent curators here at the museum that get to do that for us. But um, when Andrea uh, approached me about this Masterpieces at Midday series and this these particular artworks, I jumped at the chance of speaking with you all. My background before I became a museum director was as a curator and my, un, my graduate studies, I received a master's in Latin American art from the University of Texas at Austin. So this is territory that I, I know quite well from a scholarly perspective, but I have to say that this is, um, very much a personal uh, personal close treasure as well and that is because as I grew up I, I'm originally from Texas so if you see on the map here at uh, the very southern tip of Texas there's a Brownsville Matamoros uh, little dot there and that's where I was born and I'm originally from and my family traveled to Mexico City every single summer. My parents were educators and artists and the formative years of my life were really visiting all of the artworks and murals um, that we're going to see here today as a child and it really um, there we've got a little pole here um, just to help people see where um, where sort of orient where we are Phoenix in relationship to um, Mexico City but this city for me holds a very special place in my heart because it's really where I learned um, and saw art really for the very first time and it's because of the artworks that I saw that you're gonna see today as a child I learned to have um, a real uh, sense of pride in my heritage and um, in my culture and where I came from. So these works and these artists hold a particularly special place in my heart as they do to many, many Mexican Americans and Mexicans um, across the land. So let's get started. So why do we do Masterpieces at Midday and what are we doing? Well, Masterpieces at Midday really is an effort for the museum to show off its permanent collection. One of the things that the museum does is um, invite living artists to do, uh, to commission, we commission living artists to do a new work that's in response to a lot of the things that are going on in our world today. But what the museum also does is we care for and steward prized objects in our permanent collection that we make sure get studied and um, learned about from not only the students on our campus at ASU, but for lifelong learners such as yourselves. So it's part of our mission um, to, to make sure that these artworks that are in our permanent collection get, get seen and appreciated and studied. And these two works by Diego Rivera and David Alfaro Siqueiros are in our permanent collection. They're in a gallery that we called Art in Focus, um, where we really um, seek to um, not only look at these images by themselves, but really contextualize them in uh, who the artists were and their significance in the history of art, but also in the history of humankind. So we're really proud to have these two beautiful works and they enter the collection um, through the gift of Oliver B. James, who was a lawyer here in Phoenix, who donated these works along with some other masterpieces, including Edward Hopper and Georgia O'Keeffe and some other really, really fantastic works that we get to live with. So um, next slide. Um, 
So we're going to talk about Los Tres Grandes, or um, as, as we translate, the three greats who are really the modern masters of, um, of uh, art in Mexico. And they're, these three are key historical figures. And I, I just want to take a moment. By the way, my presentation is going to be much more conversational and informal, but uh, please feel free to ask questions or you know, put them in the chat as well. But so why do we call these the three greats? Well, unlike in the United States where you have an artist like say Warhol or mm, maybe you know, O'Keefe, where they're known, they're known as artists. But in Mexico, the, these three artists are not known just in the realm of art. In fact, if you ask any Mexican citizen or many Mexican American citizens, these artists uh, loom large. Their legacy is uh, moves way past the artistic field into really being um, masters of telling the history of Mexico. So they're really much more uh, well known. I would say any any child or adult really understands these artists and their importance in the um, inscribing of what Mexico is today. So it's a little bit different than the kind of tradition and how we view art here in the United States. Um, the other thing about why these are the three greats, why do they call them the three greats? Well, the three greats um, are famous for creating large public art murals that celebrated the history, traditions, um, and culture of the indigenous and mestizo people of Mexico. Well, that doesn't sound quite so radical, does it? But actually, at the time they were making art about history and traditions of indigenous people, that was a pretty radical thing to do. And in order to do that, oops, what am I? There we go. Um, in order for you to understand why that was radical, I'm going to attempt to give you a little uh, bit of context in Mexico history. So I'm going to try my best to uh, summarize the last 600 or so years of Mexi <laughs> of history of Mexico in a few slides so that you understand what I mean when we look at the work um, in context. So what do, what do I mean by radical? Well, we're going to start, although by no means is this the beginning of the history of Mexico, but for our purposes, we're going to start with the Spanish conquest of Mexico, which began in the 1500s and was led by the conquistador Hernan Cortez, um, and uh, he and uh, he came here on behalf of the Spanish crown um, for the three G's. And you've got a little poll here and guessing in what those three G's were. But um, up to this point, um, up to the point of when the Mexican, uh, the three greats were painting, really there was one and only really one story of Mexico and that that was that the Spaniards and Europe were civilized, they held all the aesthetics, all the beauty, they were um, the you know intelligent civilization and the native people of the Americas were savage, they were primitive, they were um, native and unsophisticated and this kind of, oh good, gold, God, and glory, 100%. Pretty good, guys. So um, the, uh, thank you. So think about that as, uh, as, um, as we think about it. And here on, on the image on the left is what you would have seen in art of that time or um, on the right, these um, codex, codices or prints of, um, the indigenous people sort of slaving over the land. And what happened with the conquest of the Americas was that the Spaniards um, became very wealthy. There was a lot of gold and other precious metals um, and a lot of um, uh, uh, taming of the land through the exploitation of labor, free slave labor. And that was a very cruel conquest as many of us already know. But what it, what it really did in terms of the history of images and the history of how people thought of Mexico is that those that were closest to the Spanish crown and closest to Europe were highly sophisticated and highly valued and those less uh, close to Spain and European blood and heritage were less valued. 
And unlike the um, Raj in India, where the British, uh, you know, uh, P British colonial rule or imperial rule in India, uh, where it was very separated, in the Americas there was a difference in that the Spanish came and intermarried, and I use intermarried very loosely um, because I think a lot of that was forced, but the Spanish came and mixed with the indigenous populations. And what happened was a very strict caste system that was enacted um, during colonial time. So um, what, what happened was we had a system in which, for example, on the top left, if you were uh, if you were of uh, had, were born in Spain, um, that uh, meant that you were of the highest order. If say you were of Spanish heritage but were born in Mexico, you would then be the second highest order. And if you were born in Spain and had a little bit of indigenous blood, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way to the to the end where you had Africans and natives, and this formal caste system was codified. So if you were Spanish, you could wear silk, you could own land, you could vote. If, and um, if you were indigenous, you couldn't wear shoes, for example, or you could only wear cloth, or you weren't able to enter into certain um, areas. So it was a very codified system that was produced here. And think about, you know, there's a, there's a saying in Spanish that is still said today, and it's called mejorando la raza, which means bettering the race. So the more Spanish blood, the more pure and white you are, th that was really the goal. And that psychology of looking toward Europe and looking toward uh, Spain and European blood as being the highest and most prized continues, unfortunately, to this day. And indeed, even after the Me Mexican independence from Spain in 1810, little has changed in the way uh, that people thought about the European hierarchy of structure. And this really reached a crisis point, I would say a critical uh, point in, in, 18, in the 1800s, late 1800s. On the, on the left here is a, a general, is a, a man named Porfirio Diaz, and he was a, um, president of Mexico in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and his presidency was characterized by dictatorship. He and his um, group, his cohort of people, were said to have been really important to Mexico in that they, he tried to launch Mexico into the age of modernity. Um, invite industrialization, bring in the railroad, electricity, these kinds of things. But in doing so, he invited a lot of foreign um, companies and foreign countries into Mexico to establish factories and railroads and so on. And what happened is that it produced great wealth for those foreign companies and uh, for a very small elite ruling class, again, mostly Spanish, white um, ruling class. And um, in order to modernize Mexico, um, it, you, it necessitated the labor of a mass amount of peasants, indigenous peasants or mestizo peasants. Mestizo means um, the mixture of European and indigenous blood which happened. So in order to do that, there was a, a great many people who were living in you know, extreme poverty with a very small elite ruling class uh, benefiting from you know, the industrial age of, of Mexico. And what happened was a revolution. So the revolution took place in 1910, um, and it went on for approximately 10 years. And it really did come from the peasant class. On the left is a picture of Pancho Villa in the north of Mexico, who led revolutionary um, armies against this ruling class. And on the right is a print of Emiliano Zapata, who, uh, Together, Zapata and Villa and a few others led with the slogan, Tierra y Libertad, which means land and liberty. And what these uh, men and the people of Mexico called for is they said those who work the land, where it says right here, there's a translation, la tierra es que quien la trabaja. 
those who work the land should have the land. So many of these um, people of, in, Mex in Mexico were working land that were owned, vast tracts of land um, that were owned by a few small people and outside foreign companies. And they believed that, um, and for next to nothing and for almost uh, a feudal system. And they believed that they had the right and the liberty to have a little bit of land, education, food to feed their families, um, and democracy and, and a vote. And that is what the Mexican Revolution was about. And it finally ended in the 1920s. Um, and many, a, success, a succession of leaders took place and um, uh, the uh, rep PRI, the party, the, the PRI um, political party um, prevailed. And the president, Alvaro Obregón, uh, uh, appointed this man that we see here. His name is Jose Bosconcelos. He was a poet um, as the secretary of education. And what's really interesting is in many countries around the world, including Mexico, um, politicians actually came from artistic circles, poets, musicians, not so much in the United States, but this, po this poet and uh, cultural visionary knew that um, as, a, as the head of the Secretary of Education, he was going to have to reinscribe and retell the story of Mexico from the point of the revolutionaries and the revolution. And in order to do that for a largely illiterate population, because so many of them had been denied access to education, um, that one of the best ways to go about it was to uh, embark on a great uh, government funded uh, mural program, which is what he did. And it's the time where Mexican muralism flourishes because again, it's not just for museums, it's not just for elite working class, but this artwork was for the people. And one of the reasons it was so popular is that this artwork was for the people and it was also uh, cited, a lot of these artworks were cited in some of Mexico's most public uh, places, places that anyone had the right to go to. Um, so it was not just for a few. So for example, some of the most important murals and some, this is a place I went every summer with my mom and dad and brother was the, it's the Palace of Fine Arts right in the heart of Mexico City. So this was something that was available and accessible to all. And the other thing that was really important is that while the artists that I'm gonna talk to you about certainly understood um, uh, Michelangelo and Raphael and they had studied in Europe and certainly knew about European traditions, they also consciously wanted to refer back to pre-Hispanic uh, mural traditions that had also served the purpose of telling people about their history and lineage. So it was very conscious of them to resurrect these, um, these images. In fact, the artists that I am talking to you about, many of them were great collectors of pre-Columbian art, um, which was great. And what they also wanted to do is they were inspired by this um, illustrator. His name is Jose Guadalupe Posada. Perhaps some of you have seen his works, but he was an illustrator who um, uh, was a s political satirist and he um, would, uh, in broadsheets, um, uh, put these images in um, into prints that the public could see during the revolution and he satirized the elite, the ruling elite. And the, the three greats really loved this idea that artwork could be seen, um, reprinted and seen by so many people. So they also were very inspired by the most democratic approach to art making. So here, here we are, the three greats, Orozco de Rivera and Siqueiros. So we're gonna start alphabetically um, with Orozco. So Orozco actually used to go into Pasada's workshop, workshop, so he knew him very well. Sorry? Did somebody say something? Something, anybody? Okay, oops, I don't know how to get back to my slide. Hold on. Oh gosh, what happened? Hold on, are you guys all there? Yeah, Mickey, we're here and we can still see your presentation. Okay, but I can't see it. You probably got buried on your screen. Oh, there it is. Okay, there it is. Uh, sorry. Hi. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm almost done. 
We can ask questions in a minute. Well, so Posava, um, uh, all three of these artists, I'll just go back really quickly, all three of these artists shared uh, what I've, I've mentioned, a real uh, love uh, of um, indigenous and native culture, um, where, where it had previously been seen as uncivilized, unsophisticated. These artists sought to um, glorify peasants, the peasant class, the indigenous class, um, and really reinscribe the greatness of the Aztec, Olmec, Maya, Zapotec traditions um, and cast them in a new light. Um, they did so in very different ways, and you'll see what I mean. So Orozco, for example, here on the left is Cortez and La Malinche. So these are very important figures in the history of Mexico. I've already talked to you about Hernan Cortez, who was the conquistador. The legend is that, the, that he, when he arrived, he didn't speak the languages of the peoples of Mexico, of course. And um, what he did is he um, uh, used this uh, princess, this Aztec princess named, known as Malintzin, who, because she was a upper class um, princess, knew many of the languages and he used her as his translator. Um, and it, the story is that she has now been seen as the traitor of the Mexican people um, and uh, the child of the, their union really is the mestizo, is the Mexican. But here you see Posada not show Hernan Cortez as a glorified man, but seen them in the nude, asking us to really reconsider Maline Seen's place in history. Was she really a traitor? Did she even have a choice? Was she uh, ripped from her family and everything that she knew and enslaved to this person? And um, so Basada is sort of flipping the script on everything that people had been told. And here, and you'll see this in the rest of the images, He's showing the Zapatistas. These are followers of Emiliano Zapata, and he is in. Um, he is putting on canvas the workers, the the revolutionaries, the fighters, the common people of Mexico. Up until then, you only saw paintings of the ruling class, of gods and goddesses, of presidents. It was not until you these artists that you begin to see the real people of Mexico profiled. Imagine going into museums or see, going into um, any place where you see art and all you see is one kind of person. And for the first time ever, you and your family um, get to see your lineage, your people um, painted. So that's what I mean by this was radical and why it's been so important. Here's another example of the kind of work that he was, uh, that they were doing, really putting integrity empathy, compassion into the people of Mexico, not from a, a judgmental, but from a really raising up the power of the people of Mexico and the landscapes of Mexico. Um, and here's an example um, of the kind of uh, the scale uh, that these works would have been. And so as you walk in to really see the grandness of people who'd been put down, who'd been minuscule, who'd been invisibilized, to see these on such grand scale and in major, major um, centers in Mexico City was, uh, to this day, is, an, is incredible um, to see. Diego Rivera, and here's our Nina, um, that we that belongs to us. Diego Rivera spent a lot of time in Paris and really understood um, European traditions. He's also, he's more known, his work is more known for, for being more celebratory. You can see that the works here are more um, sort of folkloric and, you know, gorgeous than the other two artists that I'll, that I'm showing today, which were much more radical and political. But nevertheless, uh, Rivera was very interested in retelling the story of, uh, of the people of Mexico. Here's a great example. Now this mural is in the presidential palace. So imagine this mural the, um, being at the White House or in Congress. A con you know, it, in the United States, we don't have mural of our indigenous people. <laughs> you know, we have Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, but we don't have that. And here in Mexico, in the presidential palace, you have Diego Rivera, rewriting history as it were. So the white uh, robed man in the middle is uh, was the chief of the Aztec market. So this was the marketplace 
um, of old Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico. And it is said that he would walk up and down the aisles of this market in his white robes. And if there were any stains on that robe, the market was to be closed immediately. Why is that an important story? It's an important story when you think about what the Spanish uh, and co you know, colonizers were saying about the dirty, filthy, uh, uncivilized um, Aztecs. You see here this great civilization behind with um, you know, uh, uh, buildings and temples. For certain, when you look at this, you see the sophistication and the glory and the integrity and dignity of the Aztec people, which up until the Mexican Revolution was really not celebrated. So again, um, as you go into the presidential palace and you see these images, and they are huge, there's an image for scale there. Um, uh, the presidential palace is filled with these murals of the history of Mexico and um, if you ever go there, people will teach you. On the lower right hand side or on the, in the lower middle, you'll see uh, Frida Kahlo uh, and her sister. Her sister is wearing the red sweater and Frida Kahlo who helped Rivera and hopefully we can talk about Frida Kahlo in, at another time, but she was certainly important here, but I just thought I'd point that out. And lastly, Siqueiros. Siqueiros was by far the most radical. He actually fought in the revolution. So he had a firsthand knowledge of the front lines and was very critical of um, what happened after the Mexican Revolution. Some say, did anything really change? Um, so he was very uh, critical. But here again, um, someone who's looking at um, the child and mother from a beautiful place of compassion. And again, here on the right, the torment of Cuauhtémoc. So Cuauhtémoc was the Aztec king that um, uh, met Hernán Cortés and who was ultimately defeated and was tormented. Again, from the perspective of Spanish colonizers, the Aztecs were savages and brutal and they killed people at will. Um, and from here, we're looking at the point of view of a, a, a leader who was tormented um, by, um, by dogs, by you know, Spanish conquistadors who were seeking to exploit. And so again, these images are very much reinscribing the history of um, what we had been taught up until now. Um, in incredibly important. Here's just another um, scale and sort of insight uh, look, but you can see with the image on the right, the kind of urgency, uh, the kind of uh, movement um, that Siqueiros had, you really can tell, or at least I can, that he really did experience what it was like to be up against um, all of the revolutionaries, the women helping and, and fighting for freedom for their own land and, and um, education. And here's just another image of uh, the kind of Siqueiros. So they were massively large in scale. And this is our Siqueiros. And you can see this is a painting that we have, but it was possibly a study for a larger mural. And you can even see um, the, if you kneel down on the ground and you look it up, you see these studies of the foreshortening as something that he would have been looking at to create these large scale things. And then, you know, the, the, the legacy of Mexican mural con continues to this day. I would argue that um, the legacy of colonialism still is with us. The idea of racism against indigenous and black people in Mexico is certainly still something that everyone in Mexico continues to fight. And um, uh, people uh, unfortunately still want to be uh, lighter and more closely associated with their Spanish heritage than they do with their indigenous heritage. But the, the legacy also continues in the United States because- hey, Mickey? Yeah? We have a question. Yeah? Uh, Michael asked, on average, how long would it take to complete one of these large scale murals? Uh, it would depend, but I would say years. Um, because it wouldn't be just one mural, it would be like in, like in um, European, they'd be cycles. So it would be a whole building that the uh, artist would be given and they would do complete one mural and another mural and another mural. So uh, one mural might take six months, but the entire program, the series would take two to three years. Um, and I'm just showing you the, um, that these artists were invited into the United States. So this is at Pomona College. 
Um, this is a Rivera that is at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. And this was um, a Cicado's uh, mural that was in Los Angeles on Olvera Street. So um, they also influenced the Works Progress Administration in the United States. Our own WPA murals here in the US were greatly influenced by um, the Mexican muralists, and the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, the civil rights movement of Mexican Americans, particularly in California, but in the Southwest. These murals are from Chicano Park in San Diego. Um, they were still using the um, tenets and ideas that the Mexican muralists and the revolution uh, promoted to uh, get their own equal rights um, here in the United States as well. So it's very much still in, in play. And I'm going to leave you with uh, an invitation to come back to the museum. We are uh, really excited because um, our curator, Julio Cesar Morales, is working on an exhibition called Orozco, the final cut late work. And this is the last five years of Orozco, Orozco's work, which even though they're the three greats, really there is not that much um, in the United States on the work of Orozco. And we're really excited to be able to bring this exhibition. I think it's gonna be a big draw. And we're actually working with his family, with Orozco's son, who's 99, and grandson, Clemente Orozco, um, who will be here. And we're using um, ephemera letters and works that have never been seen. They've been held by the family and they're um, helping us put together this exhibition of, of the artist's later life. So we're really excited about that. So please mark your calendars. I'm gonna stop the share. I realized I talked and talked and talked and now I'd love to get some questions from you all. And um, if you want, I can go back to the share as well and show you some images. Hi, oh, we've got some Texas Texans, great. Um, what else is going on? Michael Miller, you can find information in Facebook. Um, and you can follow our website. You Please subscribe to our e-newsletter because we send out lots of news, news um, about that. Uh, let's see, on average, let's see, Michael, uh, where can we find as we send one? Um, Amy, could you comment on the murals we have in Phoenix, for example, on 7th Street in Central? Well, I live right off of 7th Street, so I see, I get to see murals all the time. Yes, like I said, with the legacy, um, you know, we think about murals here in the United States, and we, when we think about them, we think, oh, Banksy, we think, um, you know, um, tagging and, and graffiti, that sort of thing. But actually, from a Mexican-American perspective and from the Southwest and America's perspective, murals, as I showed from pre-Hispanic times to this day, are ways for artists, you know, what an artist really wants to do at the end of the day is express themselves and communicate. And murals are some of the most accessible and immediate ways to communicate. So in light of Black Lives Matter, you'll see many artists taking to the streets uh, because they want their expression, their creative expression, the way they feel about their time in this moment, the way that our three greats felt about their revolutionary times, the way to do that is to bring that to the streets, to bring that to the people. And of course, we see that in Phoenix and we're seeing that all over um for sure any other questions my mom is on the phone <laughs> and my aunt is on the phone <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions you can unmute yourself or you can also um ask in the chat Hey. All right. Oh, wait, somebody out on that? How are you? Hi. Okay. Aurora well, is one of our LACMA fellows, our museum fellows. I'm so glad you're here. Hey. Uh, yeah, well, I was just going to say a comment on the perspective from the pre-Hispanic murals. Because um, so my, my, my boss studies this a lot, so I get to hear all about it. But they were really these very um, massive programs you know, that were uh, financed by the state, you know, by either, you know, the ruling uh, leaders, either in the Aztec or in the Maya world. Um, and it's interesting to see, you know, then, you know, in, in Mexico post-revolution, that it's also the state that's funding, you know, these murals. And again, 
to you know what message is the state trying to provide to its constituency and and just bringing it now to maybe the us in a different way i know that philadelphia has a lot of murals right they have the philadelphia mural arts so what does it mean then like how does these um programs have different meanings depending on um, the leaders that are supporting them or funding them and what do they mean, you know, in their social um, space and time? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point when you are funded by the government. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's a very good point because um, Cicados actually had to leave Mexico for some time um, because some of the works were not uh, approved um, by by the Mexican government. Um, so it's true when you are being commissioned by the government, what is your loyalty and what is the freedom of expression that you have? Um, I would say that in Philadelphia and even in Phoenix, a lot of our murals are uh, funded by the city of Phoenix. Um, they uh, attempt to um, give artists a pathway to expressing their own history, but what is the ability of risk and experimentation? And I think that that is where maybe museums can do a, a good job or a better job and that we don't have those allegiances and we can really give the artist way more runway to be more freedom, uh, to have more freedom. So I think both, we, we need to have both public art as well as private art. And certainly the artists that I talked about also made, um, uh, discrete art objects. They made paintings and, you know, um, as well as murals. You know, I got a question for you. When you, when you look at the, when you take the literature side of the Mexican Revolution, what you see in, in embodied in the literature is a, is a different view, I think, of, you see a, a revolution that while it had big, big themes, was really fought by people who didn't have a clear ideology. And that was one of the legacies of the, the Mexican Revolution was that there were lots of different ideologies running around. When we look at the murals and the paintings, if you look at that entire space, do you see that same type of um, variation across artists? Or do you see more of a romanticized view of, you know, uh, a, a really unified, ideologically solid, uh, base for the revolution? Oh, I was actually just talking to um, Dean Stephen Tepper a, a couple of days ago, and he said that every moment of a revolution, people come together and then they start to sort of fracture with all of their individual agendas. And that's certainly true of these artists. They came together, they actually formed a union for artists together. They were all communists um, and felt very much that, you know, the, the land belonged to all the people and, the, and that sort of thing. Um, but their degree uh, of, of uh, devotion to certain political ideals definitely varied and changed. So if you were Cicados and fought in the revolution, you, you would most certainly have a different uh, relationship to power than say Diego Rivera, who was studying in Paris and living in New York, um, you know, and, and being entertained and wined and dined by very privileged people, Rockefeller, for example. Um, so even though he had those ideologies, he certainly didn't have them like the lived experience that a war veteran, you know, uh, would have. So yes, they were all very, very different and in fact fell out. Um, and many of the artists did. And the generation that came right after the, the, these artists, um, they were known as the La Ruptura, which means the rupture. And those, that generation of artists said, okay, enough with like cactus and, you know, um, like beautiful images. Like we actually want to do abstraction. We want to do other kinds of things, but you, now there's, so, everybody knows Mexican art by these images, calla lilies and things, and we want to do other kinds of things. So, you know, there was a, a bell curve in terms of how artists approach their own world. So yes, the artists of the sixties and seventies really rebelled against, uh, against this. Um, and that's kind of the history of art really is, looking back at your predecessors and re-critiquing them and so forth. Well, I invite you all to our next Masterpieces at Midday. We also have an opening coming up on Saturday. Uh, we're, the museum is opening. 
in two days and we're really freaking out, but we're excited and we have a couple of great exhibitions and we're having a virtual opening on Saturday night with the artist giving us a behind the scenes uh, tour and music and all kinds of things. So I, I really hope that you will continue to join us and we've got another Masterpieces at Midday coming up. Check out on Facebook and really appreciate that you guys are here and taking an hour of your lives to just think about art <laughs> and um, think and support the museum. Appreciate you. Andrea, do you have anything to say? So I also wanted to extend the invitation to anyone who's local. When we open on Thursday, we're opening with a cleansing and a blessing. Um, the tickets are on Eventbrite. It's on our Instagram page if you're interested, but we will be having a socially distanced, brief outdoor um, cleansing and blessing by a local healer to prepare us and welcome back the students. And if anyone's interested in joining, um, please do so. We'd love to see you. Um, of course, it's ASU, so please bring your face mask. And the next uh, masterpiece is Thursday. It's by one of our Wingate curatorial interns. His name is Kevin Klein, and he will be talking about Robert Arneson, an artist in our ceramics research collection and the museum's collection that we have some wonderful pieces by. Thank you all. See you soon. Happy Tuesday. You guys were the highlight of my day. <laughs> okay. <laughs>